Welcome to the G5 Hive and our next installment of our Worker Bee series, where we deep dive into the G5 college football landscape with the folks that know the teams the best. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're listening in podcast form, please rate and review. Today, we'll be taking a look at the Old Dominion Monarchs, who finished 6-7 and seven last season and capped off their season with an appearance on the famous Toastry Bowl. They wrapped up their 2024 spring practice with their spring showcase on April 13th. We have two special guests joining us today. They started out as a group of friends tailgating together and has grown into the best source for information on Old Dominion athletics. From podcasts to articles to athletes and IL merchandise, they have you covered. They are for fans and by the fans. They are the ODU Monarchists. Joining us today from the Monarchists are Mike Langston and David Asbury. The ODU Monarchists can be found on X at ODU Monarchists. Welcome to the show, Mike and David. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's good to be here. Well, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, the history of the Monarchists, and how long you've been covering Old Dominion Athletics. All right, so the group kind of started as a, a Twitter DM group during the worst season in Old Dominion football history, the one-win season. Uh, and it was kind of more of like a, a place for me to share information with people I knew and trusted, uh, but also for us to kind of just share in misery together and uh, – it kind of grew from there. We started tailgating together. And then uh, me and Aaron were going on the, the Wake Forest trip and started talking. We drove down together. And it was just kind of, why don't we do a podcast? Because there was zero ODE podcast. Didn't really make sense to us. Uh, we had some great connections inside the athletic department. And it just kind of made sense for us to try to do it and uh, give ODE fans something to cover our great athletic program. Yeah. 2019 was a very rough season for us. I, I've been a fan uh, since I was a sophomore at ODU when I attended the first football game against Jawan back in 2009. And 2019 was when Mike DM'd me saying, Hey, do you want to join our DM group of ODU fans? And it grew pretty organically from there as a good fan group. And uh, I remember that Wake Forest trip that Mike mentioned. I uh, went to Wake Forest for law school. I went to ODU for undergrad and Wake Forest for law school. So that was a very uh, special trip for me. And uh, I feel like we've grown this group to be something special. And uh, we very much enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Well, I, I can tell you guys, I, I'm certainly very appreciative of the work you guys do. Like you said, there's literally no coverage and i mean and that's the main reason why we do this podcast is there's no coverage of g5 in general um and so you know to see uh you guys covering old dominion is awesome um for folks that know me they call me the old dominion guy and i'm here to tell you like these guys probably dwarf my knowledge when it comes to old dominion athletics so we definitely got got the right guys here on today um for those not familiar with the monarch's offensive style how would you describe it to them it's wide. It's fast. Um, if you've watched Tennessee football at all, it's a good kind of basis, baseline for what we're doing. We're uh, doing things a little bit differently, but for the most part, the receivers are split out wide, which is going to create a lot of uh, holes for the offense, either in the running game or the passing game. Um, it opens field uh, plays downfield, but really, to me, this is a rushing-based offense, and you could see that last year with how much we improved as a rushing team. Um, didn't matter who was getting the ball, they were gaining yards, and that's going to be no different this season, I don't. Th I think. I, I agree. If you want to know a lot about this wide split offense, uh, you can Google uh, Nick Saban talking about the Tennessee Volunteers. You have to defend the whole width of the field. There's going to be wide receivers stacked on both sides, and it's kind of a pick your poison. Do you want to cover those receivers or you want to prevent the run? And there's no right answer because you're going to leave something open, um, whether it's the receivers on, on the side or you're going to leave big running space. And last season you saw that as Mike uh, hinted at that uh, we improved dramatically in the running game. And we expect that to continue in this uh, with Kevin Decker as the offensive coordinator. All right, uh, let's get to the position where it all starts on offense, and that's the quarterback. Last season starter Grant Wilson is back. After spring, Jack Shields left for Buffalo, 
and they brought in Emmett Moorhead from Boston College, and they also returned Colton Joseph. For those not familiar with Grant Wilson, he was a transfer from Fordham in 2023, following his offensive coordinator, Kevin Decker, over to the Monarchs. How did Grant Wilson look this spring? Um, I mean, he looked the best of the bunch, but there were some issues we saw at the spring game, um, missed some throws. Uh, but he he has definitely taken more of a leadership role this spring and this summer. Uh, you can see it with his teammates and how much more he's interacting with them. Uh, he's kind of taken hold of this is his program. However, he also was one of the worst quarterbacks in the country last year in missed throws. I think he was 124 out of 125 on ESPN's overthrow percentage. It was not great. Um, I think it was like 20. It was it was a high number, and that is something that needs to change in 24 if he wants to keep his role as starting quarterback. Yeah, we really hope that he takes that next step forward and can have a better accuracy, especially with deep throws. Part of that is there's a lot of deep throws and every quarterback is going to be less accurate with deep throws than they are with their checkdowns. But the other part of that, is, part of that is he can just improve on accuracy and, and getting on the same page as his receivers. Um, the other thing that we should note about him is he's actually a pretty good dual threat. Uh, he can run. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll get into the uh, pass protection later, but uh uh, if it wasn't for sacks, he would have had 600 rushing yards this season. He had some pretty big runs against Georgia State, Georgia Southern, even Western Kentucky in the famous Toastery Bowl. He's a dual-threat quarterback, and a lot of people don't know that about him. Um, he can hit the deep shots. He can run the ball. Um, but, yeah, accuracy is important, and it, he needs to improve there. And Emmett Moorhead is coming in. And uh, I, I think Grant Wilson entering his fourth season under this offense uh, will be the guy on week one. But uh, he definitely has a lot to prove, a lot left in the tank. Uh, and I look excited to see how he's going to do against South Carolina. So with uh, them bringing Moorhead and Colton Joseph returning, if you guys had to guess who would be the number two behind Wilson, who, who do you think that might be? I think it's going to be Emmett. Um, Colton kind of took a step back in the spring. Um, he wasn't playing that free willing style that made him so popular among his teammates in the fall. Um, I'm not sure what happened or, but to get him back to where he was, it's, it's going to take a lot. Emmett on the other hand has arm talent that no one else on this team has. And if he can make the right throws in practice, he's really going to be pushing Grant for that starting role. Because Ricky did say this job is still open, uh, though he gave the edge to Grant with his leadership and his knowledge of the system. If Emmett can come in and hit the ground running, it's, it's going to be really interesting to watch that position group. And I think uh, if, if Wilson is a starter, I agree. Week one, is still oh, – go ahead. If Wilson is the starter week one, won't, well, this will be the first time under Ronnie we've had back-to-back -back, uh, star same starters, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, it's been a while. It's uh, I don't know who was the last one before this. Was it? Uh, it was Taylor, right? Uh, is David sorry. Washington? Taylor Heineke. Taylor Heineke was the last back-to-back. Uh, -back. Wow. Washington didn't <laughs> start in uh, 2015. Yeah. So Schuyler if Wilson Bentley. starts week one this season, he'll be the first quarterback to start week one in two consecutive seasons since Taylor Heineke did it in 2013 and 2014. So this, so it would be a big accomplishment to have some consistency at quarterback. Um, I agree with Mike that uh, Colton is, a, he's a, he was a freshman, true freshman last year. I think he's still learning, still developing. And I think, the top two spots are going to be Grant Wilson and Emmett Moorhead from Boston College. Emmett Moorhead had some really high highs at Boston College, but he couldn't lock down that starting position there. Um, and but at the same time, 
if he wasn't there in spring ball, I think Emmett Moorhead still has to learn this offense in the fall to really compete with Grant Wilson. And, and it's that reason why I think Grant Wilson's going to be the guy week one. But at the same time, who knows what's going to happen at fall camp. All right, uh, let's move over to the running game. This room will look a little bit different than it did in 2023 with the, uh, the, the top three running backs from a year ago having gone. Um, that leaves us with Devin Roche as the leading rusher uh, returning from this room. They did bring back uh, – they brought in Aaron Young from Rutgers and Bryce Duke from Virginia Tech via the transfer portal, both of which were who, who were there in the spring. Um, and then, you know, Kadarius Callaway left, uh, Kishan Wicks and Obisani – uh, entered, uh, I believe, after the spring game. What did you guys think of this running back room in the spring? I really like Devin Roche. The, the coaches do, too. That's why they wanted to preserve that red shirt for him last year. Um, he's going to be a very good back for us, uh, especially like a third down guy, someone that can change a pace. Um, his speed is second to none on this roster. But I really like the addition of Aaron Young and Bryce Duke. Aaron Young kind of brings a nice veteran quality to the room. And then Bryce Duke is someone they're excited that he can make plays in multiple different ways out of the backfield as a running back or as a pass catcher. Uh, I've heard that they might try to use him more interestingly than we've seen backs used under Ricky. Uh, he could be running up. He could be lining up as like kind of a fullback uh, tight ends kind of transitioning throughout the field, moving him all over the place to make plays. And uh, they're very high on Bryce Duke. Yeah, I'm really excited about this running back room, which is a really strange thing to say after the top three running backs actually left. You had Kadarius Calloway go to California, Obisani and Keyshawn Wicks are in the transfer portal. Um, but they brought in Aaron Young, who Aaron Young, is a legacy his older brother jordan young was a linebacker for us um and one of the best linebackers we've ever had before jason henderson came here um and he was a change of pace back for rutgers and he scored some pass catching touchdowns and you can say the same thing about bryce duke at virginia tech and then mike stole what i was going to say about devin roche that uh he was a true freshman last year and the coaching staff very specifically only let him play for regular seasons games so he wouldn't burn his red shirt. So we got three really good running backs that fit this system, that fit what Ricky, Ronnie, and Kevin Decker want to do on the offense. I think this offense fits them like a glove, and I think they're going to fit it like a glove. I think our running game is going to be very good this season. So you, you guys mentioned uh, Aaron Young, Bryce Duke, and Devin Roche, and then even Tariq Sims um, looked, in my opinion, looked really good in the spring game. In the past, we've seen a pretty heavy, you know, running back by committee or rotation, if you will, under under Coach Ronnie. Do you expect that to continue this year? And do you think it's going to be a, a three man committee, a four man committee, or what do you think? There's so much talent in this group, this, in this room, that uh, the committee way is probably the smartest way to. You're going to preserve the guys from injury because you're not going to have anyone overworked. Um, you're also going to get a lot of fresh carries and touches out of these guys. And you're also not going to waste talent on the bench because they're not getting touches. So the committee way makes the most sense for this group, in my opinion. And you saw last year, it was mostly by committee. It was Keyshawn Wicks, one. One week is Kadarius Calloway. Another week it was Obisani getting his touches. Is Devin Roche getting his touches? Uh, I definitely think it's going to be a running back room by committee. But and you mentioned Tarek Sims. Tarek Sims had a very good spring. He made some big plays in the spring practices that they posted on Twitter. And then at the spring game, he had some very big runs. And if he's the fourth running back in the room, that just speaks to how deep this position group really is. So I, I do think ODU is going to have a very good running game, um, even when we get the fourth or even fifth back in there. 
do you think um, there'll be like really well defined roles? Like, you know, Devin Roche, I think it definitely, you know, a change of pace back. He's a much smaller guy. Is there a guy you see as like maybe the short yardage goal line guy or, or the guy that gets like, you know, or, or, or two guys, you know, last year, even though we had a rotation, Wicks and, and um, Callaway got the majority of the carries. You think maybe that's Duke and Young, or what do you guys think? Yeah, it's likely going to be Duke and Young. Um, I know last year injuries kind of dictated a lot for this room, but for this group, I mean, they're, they're the veterans. They're the most talented guys. I don't know. It's It makes the most sense to just have those two getting the majority of the carries. But still, Sims – Roche, I think there's others on the this group that can even make plays. You don't want to just rely on those two guys all the time. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, we still don't know what fall camp's going to happen. Um, I know Devin Roche had a pretty short goal line run during the spring game, which looked pretty promising for um, – who's going to be the goal line back for, for him and for the team. But fall camp hasn't happened yet, so it's kind of hard to say which back is going to be the guy. Uh, Bryce Duke does look like a good pass catcher, which we didn't do a whole lot of last season. So I'm very interested, interested to see if Aaron Young and Bryce Duke can open up uh, the check downs to running backs, uh, catching the ball out of the backfield and getting some yards. All right, if you guys are calling the play first game or the first running play, I should say, who's go- who do you think is going to get that first carry against South Carolina? It's probably going to be Grant, to be honest, if I had to put my money on anything. <laughs> That's actually a very good bet, is Grant Wilson just faking it and taking the ball and probably taking it for an unexpected 15-yard gain uh, is probably the best bet. But if you want to make me pick a running back, I'm going to say Aaron Young. He's a super senior. He's very, um, I think he's RB1. But again, Bryce Duke may be RB1. He may be RB2. It may not even matter. They may get, you know, the exact same amount of carries. Um, But I agree with Mike. The best bet is Grant Wilson is going to take the first run. All right. uh... Let's uh, get back to that passing game. And just like the running game, we saw several wide receivers hit the portal this spring. Um, however, Kelby Williams, Isaiah Page, Dominic Dutton all return. They bring in Deontay Vines from Iowa. And then after the spring, they brought in Dallas Sims from Minnesota and Peanut Houston came over from Missouri. How did the wide receivers look in the spring? Uh, Deontay Vines is a star in the making if he can continue to play like he has. Uh, he had an insane catch in the spring game. Uh, the guy is just super talented. Obviously, he hasn't had a lot of work catching balls in college in that Iowa offense, but uh, not many not many people have in that Iowa offense. Um, I don't know. I'm really excited about this group as a whole. Uh, I've never seen them add this much talent in one offseason, and it's pretty exciting. Yeah, Deontay Vines, I just have this image of my head of him just on the sideline thinking, what is going on while the rest of the Iowa offense is just famously inept while he was there? So uh, they actually raced, and they did 10-yard races, and Dominique Dutton was a track star at South Carolina before transferring to ODU. He was famously the fastest guy at ODU. Uh, Deontay Vines beat him. He might be the fastest guy at ODU now is Deontay Vines. So in a 10 yard dash. So I'm super excited to see Deontay Vines at the spring game. Deontay Vines had a big, deep touchdown catch that was very well covered by Rashid Reason. It's everything you want to see as a fan of the cornerback playing well, the wide receiver playing well, the quarterback playing well, deep pass, touchdown. Like that, that's what you want to see. Um, I'm also very excited to see uh, – uh, Miles Alston actually had a very good spring. He won the spring offensive award, and then he had a lot of catches in the spring game. None of them super flashy, but he had a good quantity of catches. 
Um, very excited to see Isaiah Page come back for his senior year. Isaiah Page is one of Ricky Ronnie's first recruiting classes, and he's a very good slot receiver. He had a great game against JMU. Um, I agree with Mike. This is a very good receiver room, and this offense looks much better than it has been in the past. And I'll add uh, the spring game. One thing we saw that they did not do a whole lot of last season were those short and intermediate throws, which changes the whole dynamic of this offense. Um, you can take those easy passes, keep moving the ball downfield. You tire out the defense more, but you're also getting more rhythm for the quarterback and the receivers. And if they continue to build on those short and intermediate throws, this offense is going to take that sec that step in the second year that the coaches expect to take and need to take. So with, with the guys leaving, that vacates around 151 targets that are gone. How do you think those targets are divvied up? Do you think we see like a true wide receiver one, or it'll be more like last season where we spread the ball quite around quite a bit? I think Deontay is going to be your clear number one. Uh, I'm really interested to see what these guys coming in can do. Uh, Fidel Pitts hasn't been mentioned. He's a Juco receiver out of California. He's got a lot of talent, was uh, pursued by a lot of the Sunbelt schools. He could play immediately. Um, you got Peanut Houston, who was mentioned, who might be one of the highest rated players ever out of high school in Atlanta, Old Dominion, but he hasn't had a lot of opportunity. And then you got Dallas Sims, who was a four star or a high three star, maybe low four star receiver to Minnesota, only lasted there in the spring and then ends up at Old Dominion. That's a recruiting win for us, in my opinion. I mean, he was really highly sought after not that long ago. And um, he might be one of those types that can play immediately. You add that to the group of Kelby and Dutton and Page um, and then Austin and Lott, and you got a pretty good receiving room that I don't know if we've ever been able – we haven't been able to say that in a while with how deep this group could be. Yeah. But injuries um, kind of come out of nowhere, and you never know what's going to happen, so – I agree with Mike. I think it's going to be more spread out. I do think Deontay Vines is the number one guy right now. Um, but, of course, it's wide open. Kelby Williams is there. The only thing I really want to add is Dominic Dutton, the speedster from South Carolina who's on the track team, he only had like 10 catches last year. Not a lot. But four of them were deep touchdowns. He's probably still going to get his deep shots down the field. He's a speedster. But we'll also see what De uh, Deontay Vines does down the field. Um it's a pretty good wide receiver room. I think it's going to be spread out. I think Deontay Vines is going to be the number one, uh, Kelby Williams and Dominic Dutton and Isaiah Page are going to get their shots. And I think there's an important topic that we need to discuss while we're talking about the receivers and the turnover and everything. Last year's team, I mean, it's no secret to anyone, we were terrible. We gave up too many sacks. And throughout the year, Ricky – hit it hard that these are not on the offensive line. They're not on the quarterback. These are team stats. And especially in this offense, um, the choice routes were a problem last season. And people, you have an option of going deep. You can take a, a shorter route. They were taking the long developing routes too often. And a lot of the time you would see guys standing right next to each other, both run go routes, which is a dumb thing because now you have – three guys in the area covering those two deep routes. Um, the receiver, the receiving room was just as culpable for all those sacks as the offensive line and Grant were and Jack. I think with the type of right. guys that brought in, we have a smarter receiving room that is capable of running these routes the way they're meant to be run. So I'm hopeful that that means a much more efficient and, better passing attack in 2024. Yeah. Uh, sacks, which I'm sure we're going to get to when we start talking about the offensive line, they really are a team step. The quarterback can make quicker reads. The wide receivers can get open faster. And with choice routes, they can get uh, make the, the quicker route. And then, of course, the offensive line can stick to their blocks longer. Um, we, we, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about sacks very soon. But it is a team stat. 
and we can lay blame all over the field. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you guys. It's it, it wasn't it wasn't solely the offensive line. Sometimes Grant held the ball too long. Sometimes, like you said, the the receiver didn't necessarily uh, make the smartest decisions. Um, so that you know, you, you guys talked about the choice routes. Do you think now that we're in year two and with these new players that we're going to see a big difference and, and maybe more in sync with the quarterback and wide receiver in terms of, of making those better decisions? Yeah. Um, I mean, the staff has talked about it a lot. Year two is when you see an offense really look like it should. So that's the one thing we're missing is the, the routes and the passing game looking the way that it should. It definitely didn't look that way to me last year that it did not look like the Tennessee offense, even though that's the one comparison people keep drawing. Um, we need to be more efficient and effective in the passing game, and I think that has to happen this year, or this could be a very ugly season. Yeah, and there's a lot of turnover in the wide receiver room, and we have a new wide receiver coach, actually, a Kansas State fan. Fans may recognize Cody Cook, who played some reserve quarterback for Kansas State when he was a wide receiver. Um, he was a quarterback coach, or excuse me, a wide receiver coach at – uh, Hutch Community College, and he is now our new wide receiver coach. And uh, he is, uh, was a grad assistant at Tennessee, so he knows this offense. He knows the room. And another year under Kevin Decker, the offensive coordinator, will have this offense more in sync All right, uh, let's move over to the tight ends. You know, last season it seemed like the tight ends had to had to stay in and block more than maybe the the coaches had thought. But can can you guys describe for someone that maybe has never seen a game how the tight ends should be utilized in this offense? So I mean, we've seen them put out wide. We've seen them put in on the line, uh, basically as like a kind of a fullback. They won't. They keep calling it a tight end, but it's well, basically exactly. a fullback staying in to block for the running backs and the quarterback. Um, Jalen Butler might have been our best running blocker and pass blocker last season. I don't think we had that success on the ground without him. Um, but the guy is a talented uh, playmaker, and he just didn't have a lot of opportunity last year to do that because of our issues blocking in the passing game. Um, but, yeah, he should be lining up all over the field. Um, and we just haven't seen that yet. Yeah, Jay, Jalen Butler's biggest play last year was probably a two-point conversion at State, and that was a very important play, um, but we ended up winning by a touchdown, so it didn't ultimately matter. But at the same time, like, he got open, he caught the ball, big two-point conversion, and that was, like, the biggest play I saw him make all season. Uh I would love to see more of Jalen Butler in the tight ends in this offense. He's been playing a lot of like kind of a wing back fullback um, said and the running game. And he's been very helpful in the running game, um, but he has a lot of talent. And if we can open up the tight ends in this offense, that will open up a whole lot more that this offense can do. Yeah. So I like to call it an H back because it's really not a tight end the way we're using it. Right. Uh, I've asked Ricky that question. He goes, no, it's a tight end where it's, it's tight. It's a tight end. <laughs> yeah, I remember if that one. Wanna, if you want to think back to those uh, Redskins teams with Chris Cooley, that is what we should be seeing from Jalen Butler and the other tight ends this season. Um, someone that's going to be there to block for on a running game on a running play or maybe pop out for a screen or going deep at times. Like they could literally do anything with him with the tight end position in this offense. Uh, but the passing has, the pass blocking has to be better, or I'm not sure they'll, they'll free him up to do what he can do. 
All right. Uh, we, we've talked about it a lot. Let's uh, move over to this offensive line. Um, and they do need to fill some losses. So we lose Chris Adams uh, to Memphis. Um, guard Leroy Thomas and center Xavier Black have graduated. That uh, leaves us with tackle Santana Saunders and guard Stefan Dubois Warren. Um, as the only returners, what did the staff do in the uh, offseason to kind of fill these losses? Well, first thing they did was make sure they brought in a center, and they did that with Barlev. Um, Zach Barlev is going to be your the starting center. Uh, he's come in immediately, taking the job, and not let go of it. And uh, that is huge, considering our best teams have had good center play. Uh on top yeah, of that, I'm they wrong. brought in. Oh, sorry, David. No, go ahead. Go ahead. On top of I that, I just want to talk Marlev up a little bit more. Like he's awesome. He uh, comes in from Illinois. Uh, he was on that Illinois team and played in that game where they had nine overtimes, and it's the longest football game, college football game in history. He was on that team and he played well. And I look forward to see him at center. Go on, Mike. All right. They also brought in uh, after the spring. They brought in quite a few bodies because clearly they weren't happy with offensive line play in the spring. Uh, they bring in Rick Moore from Boise State, who I expect will push for a starting position. Uh, Anthony Pat from Arizona, who got kind of caught up in coaching carousel. He goes to Arizona. His coach is there. He ends up staying through the change and then ends up on the bottom of the depth chart. Kind of what ha same thing happened to Emmett Moorhead at Boston College. Um, new coach brings in his own guys, and you you can kind of see what happens to the old. Uh, but yeah, Anthony Pat, I think I like his size and what he can bring to this team. And then they also brought in Colin Henrik from uh, Georgia State. He has he hadn't played much there. I'm not sure uh, what his his opportunity to start will be, but. They brought in a lot of bodies that can maybe change this group as a whole because they're a lot heavier, a lot bigger than they have been in the past. We were probably the smallest offensive line in the Sun Belt last year. And with these big bodies coming in, we might become one of the biggest overnight. Yeah, uh, Alex Huddle is the offensive line coach. He came in with Kevin Decker from Fordham. It's his second year there. We were talking about – uh, the improvement in offense uh, improves from year one to year two of installing the system. We're expecting some big things from Alex Huddle in this offensive line. He's my neighbor, and he's a great guy, Alex Huddle. Awesome good dude. Uh, we have some definitely some turnover. The Santana Sanders is in rookie Ronnie's first recruiting class, so he's going to be a big tackle. He can play right tackle or left tackle. Um, we also have a returning guard. Barlev is definitely the center. The other two spots, the other guard position and the other tackle position seem to be open uh, for competition. But at the same time, you have uh, Rick Moore from Boise State. Uh, you have uh, a bunch of transfers coming in. Uh, Alex Huddle is going to find the best five guys and install uh, hopefully a better pass protection from last year. Because last year we allowed 62 sacks. That is more sacks than any other FBS team allowed last year. And we already talked about that's not just the offensive line. That's on everybody. But the offensive line can certainly do better in pre preventing more sacks. All right. If you guys have to pick an offensive player to have a breakout type season in 2024, who are you picking? I'm, uh, I'm kind of torn between uh, Duke – and Vines. Uh, those two are going to have plenty of opportunity this year to do things they've never done in college football before. I think uh, I got I got to go with Vines, I think, now. Now, now that I'm kind of thinking about it. He's going to have a lot more opportunity to be that guy and really change this offense for the better in 24. You really can't go wrong with Duke or Vines or Aaron Young, who might be RB1 or – RB2. I'm I want to try to pick a more riskier one. I want to say Miles Alston. He had a really good spring. He's a slot guy. He's probably going to be slot underneath Isaiah Page. 
but I think he's going to get a lot more playing time than he did last year. I, he didn't get a single catch last year. I think he's going to be much more involved in the offense because the spring game looked like he's going to be much more involved in the offense. All right, uh, let's move over to the defensive side of the ball. And Mike's probably tired of like hearing me ask this question because I think he's probably heard me ask it like two or three times. Um, but uh, last season, the Monarchs played a three-three-five defense, and they seem to really struggle to generate pressure. Uh, will they be sticking with the three-three-five this season? And if so, how do you think they plan on getting more pressure on opposing quarterbacks? I'll let you go, David. I'm gonna. Oh, <laughs> you throw the hard question to me. Well, technically, I, I isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it more of a 3-2-5 or 3 two, six? Because we're only using it's, two it, linebackers. Certainly, and sometimes we use three. But a lot of, most, I don't know. Yeah, a lot of times you're right. You know, I, I don't think the defensive scheme will change a whole lot from last year. I, I actually think the defensive scheme for, up front seven look really good. Um, you know, when you have a three, three, you can always blitz a linebacker and it, it kind of disguises the blitz more than a four, two would. Um, but you're not wrong. We need more pressure on the quarterback. We were last in the Sun Belt last year when it came to sacks, we were last in the Sun Belt on offense when it came to sacks and we were last in the Sun Belt on defense when it came to sacks, we need more pressure up front. Uh, we do have a lot of returners up front. Uh, Denzel Lowry, who is another one of Ricky Ronnie's first recruiting classes, is going to be uh, up front on the defensive line. Amari Morrison as well as a veteran that should be uh, generating more pressure than he has. Um, we're going to blitz linebackers, I, I think, and Mike may correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our leading sack, uh, the, the guy who had the most sacks last year, was Jason Henderson. Um, we need more sacks from other people. And so Jason Henderson's freed up to do other things. Um, will Blake Seiler and the defensive coordinator, the, the defense change it up to generate more sacks? Maybe we'll have to see if he's confident in the, the guys fr in the front to get more sacks and more pressure as is before he probably decides if he wants to change it up or not. And right now we just don't know. Fall camp, a lot, a lot of things can happen in fall camp. So a couple things about the defensive formation we're doing is we're keeping those three linebackers in because if you look at our roster the last two years, you wanted Wayne Matthews, Jason Henderson, EJ Green in on every play because they were three of our best players. You still have two of those guys back this year, so you still want two of those guys on the field at all times. Um, and then you got to talk about the secondary. The last two years – We've replaced almost everybody in the secondary two years in a row. So do you want him pulling a body out of that secondary and putting it on the on the defensive line in a group that's brand new for the second straight year? Or would you rather have an extra body in the secondary because you, you don't trust that group? And I think that's something to consider and maybe might explain why we've only been running this 3-3 formation is how much do you trust the secondary in a pass-heavy league? Um, that's really what it boils down to, and I'm not sure the trust is really there yet. Yeah, for me, I would say it's like oh, it's almost a double-edged sword, pick your poison, right? Because you can have six Deion Sanders back there, and if you're not getting pressure on the quarterback, at some point, like, coverage is going to break down. It's just going to happen, right? Um, so I don't know. Like, I, I definitely agree. I mean, it's, it's pick your poison. You want to get – you want to have better coverage or you, or you want to get um, get uh, more pressure. And I don't know, hopefully we can find a more happy medium, I guess, this year, right? Yeah, I will shout out Chris Trinidad. We interviewed him a few weeks ago. They obviously think he's going to make some big improvements this year and be more impactful. If him, Amori, uh, Jalen McClain, DeAndre Lynch, Chris Spencer, Cole Daniels, Denzel Lowry, if they can all be more aggressive and effective in their pass rush, I mean, it's what we need to happen to see a change. Uh, but this defense, the way it's set up, allows us to stay in games. There's a reason why we're in so many one-score games, and it's because this defense bends but doesn't break that often. Um 
that obviously broke in a few games in that second half. But if the passing game was more effective, what's the score at that point? Um, yeah, that was not all on the defense, right? The, the offense yeah. going three and outs doesn't help the situation. Right. I mean, they were on the field more than any defense in the country last year other than maybe Tennessee's. Uh, they're going to break at some point if the offense isn't more effective. So, I I don't know. I like the defense to set up. It, it is what it is. They're trying to – it's their best option, I think, for with the talent they have and to give us chances to win. Um, it's maybe not the best – marriage of offense and defense, a quick hitting offense and a defense that bends and doesn't get off the field that often. It might not be the best marriage, but uh, the defense wasn't the problem last year. Yeah, I agree. I'm sure we'll talk about the secondary and the change up there, but it was a bend and don't break defense. It didn't allow a lot of big plays it may let you catch the five yard catch it may let you get the big run but or uh, a mediocre run but you're not getting huge touchdowns on this defense and i agree with mike that it is uh the biggest issue with the team last year is probably being more consistent with the passing game on offense and not the defense uh that actually played pretty dang good on all three levels except sacks and generating pressure that was the biggest weakness of the defense last season the second best the se oh i guess if we're going to mention weaknesses the second weakness is is running quarterbacks and containing them in the pocket uh, yeah mm -hmm. um, running quarterbacks played well against this defense unfortunately yeah it was that coastal game is just bringing me nightmares back that that was brutal to watch um e ethan yeah, go ahead <laughs> Oh, you go I was going to say Ethan Vascal from uh, Coastal Carolina was committed to ODU, and he flipped his commitment to Kansas and then eventually transferred to Coastal Carolina, and he's from Chesapeake, Virginia. He's from where you, you and I are from. He played at Oscar Smith. I used to play against Oscar Smith, so I'm very upset that he's now – and was supposed to be one of our players, and now he plays for a rival. And he ran a lot on our ODU defense last season. And um, I, I don't mean any ill will towards him. You got to do what's best for you. I, but, man, you're going to be a villain to me on the field. <laughs> well, Mike, you kind of covered the defensive line for us, or started to anyway. Um, it seemed like to me last year, you know, Amori Morrison was the really the, the standout in terms of being able to get pressure. Um, so who do you feel like needs to – step up and, and help Amori this year for that D-line to be successful? Well, I think they're putting a lot on Chris Trinidad and Denzel Lowry to both be the kind of breakout players on D-line this year. Um, they have the talent to do it. It's just – it's going to be really interesting. Uh, one thing they – we interviewed Santana Saunders, and he brought up this one thing that I'm – he said was brand new for the team this year. They're doing self-scouting, so they'll have a breakout session during practice where they can talk to each other, the offensive line, defensive line, and talk to each other about what they're doing wrong or what they're seeing that makes things work. So the communication between the O-line and D-line, that's huge. But it's also, I mean, they're teaching each other to what to look out for and what they're doing. Like, I think we could see a big jump on both in both – uh, cases. Self-scouting is not a new thing, but it's a new thing to Old Dominion, and I think it's it's awesome to hear that they're finally doing it. Um, it's We've heard issues with some players they don't like to be told from coaches what they're doing wrong, but if their buddies are telling them what they're doing wrong and they're getting exposed and, and practice for it, I think that's a great learning opportunity for all of these guys, and I'm excited to see the impact that has this season. Right. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about breakout players in the defensive line and you mentioned Amore Morrison, I want Amore Morrison to do more. Like we've been waiting for him to be the star on the defensive line. And he wasn't bad last year. I'm not going to uh, talk bad about his play last year at all, but uh, it, it was far from star level. I, I want to see more from him. I want to see him generate some more sacks. Because um, I know he's capable of doing it. 
he can do it. We just haven't seen it yet. All right. Uh, moving over to the linebackers, we lose our second leading tackler, Wayne Matthews the third. He's off to Michigan State. Uh, but standout freshman Mario Thompson returns. Obviously, we're super excited to get our All-American and leading tackler uh, from the last two years, Jason Henderson, back. And then they also return, like Mike, Mike mentioned, A.J. Green returns from injury. Um, how did the linebackers look in the spring, and did anyone stand out to you guys? I, I mean, in the spring, you didn't have Jason playing. So uh, I, I I like this group. Koa Natola came in last year and really played well in substitution for Jason when he went down with his injury. Um, E.J. Green is talented and loves hitting people and making his impact felt. And then Jason, I mean, two-time All-American, maybe the best player who's ever played here. Uh, I mean, he's pushing up for that to compete with Taylor with the accolades. And I don't know. I mean, I'm just trying to enjoy this last season of Jason because it's going to be special. Uh, people keep asking yeah. how he's feeling and all that. How is it he recovering from his injuries? This is a guy you don't want to doubt anything what he can overcome because his work ethic and his mentality is just so hyper-focused to be the best he can be that I don't know. It's it, we're lucky to have him. That's we, we are very lucky to have Jason Henderson and it's almost like an afterthought now because we're so used to having Jason Henderson being one of the best linebackers, not, not in the Sun Belt, but in all of college football. He was the only Sun Belt player to be ranked the top 100 in the new college football 25 game. The only one. He's the only All-American that I remember ODU ever having, if we've ever had a, another first-team All-American. He is on track to break the NCAA tackles record this year. He needs like 153 and don't cite me on that number. I'm, I might be off a little bit, but he needs over 150 to break it, which is a lot of tackles, but it's not a lot of tackles for Jason Henderson. He's done that twice. <laughs> so uh, he did not play in the spring. He uh, needs to fully recover, but if he has a season like he had last year or a season like he had the year before, he's probably going to the NFL next year. And we are very lucky to have him back for his senior year. He's another guy who has uh, played all four of his college years here at ODU. And Blake Seiler, I believe, was the one who recruited him. And uh, he's a great player for us. But also looking at the rest of the linebacker room, we got a pretty stacked linebacker room. Um, Mike mentioned Koa Natala. Um, Koa Natala, uh, he has hair that Troy Palomalu, and frankly, his play reminds me of Troy Palomalu. It looks like Troy Palomalu is playing for ODU whenever he's on the field. Um, he plays really well. He's one of those great stories of a guy who starts on special teams and works his way up to back up Jason Henderson and get his playing time and make the most of his playing time. So I'm excited to see Koa play in the future. You mentioned Mario Thompson. Mario Thompson was a true freshman last year. He's going to be a true sophomore this year. He filled in once EJ Green got hurt. Um, and he filled in pretty nicely getting 40 tackles, over 40 tackles. And on the other side, we'll probably have EJ Green back, who got hurt early in his senior year. So he got a medical red shirt. And uh, he's going to be on the field. And he's going to, as Mike said, he loves to hit people. So if we play a 3 3, and those are our three guys Mario Thompson, Jason Henderson, and EJ Green, we got a pretty stacked linebacker unit. And I, we were a top five Sun Belt against the run team. And we were able to stuff some very big Sun Belt names. Um, Rashin Ali, I, Rashin Ali scored on us, but he didn't get a whole lot of yards on us. Um, Marcus Carroll, uh, we were able to stuff the run pretty well last year. And I expect that to continue with this unit, especially if Jason Henderson comes back to form. I, I want to note something, though. Losing Wayne Matthews, um, right. people not, might not appreciate how big of a loss that is. Um, one thing we learned was he was uh, – obviously, Jason's the captain. He's calling the plays. Uh, but EJ was able to do that as well, and he was able to call out uh, switches, 
call out blocks and all that. He was a really good communicator and a second kind of middle linebacker on the field. And I know there's concern there for replacing a guy like that uh, because you have basically two Jasons on the field at all times. Someone that can put his teammates in the right position. That's something that you just can't replace easily. And um, I'm kind of concerned about that a little bit, but I do love this linebacker linebacker room. You guys touched on on you know Henderson's recovery from injury, but what about uh, EJ Green? Have you heard anything about his recovery? Is is he on track to be ready for fall camp? Yeah, he's on track. Um, no issues there. I, I mean, I haven't even heard issues with Jason. Um, at one point, they were like he might not be ready till October, and now they're like he's probably going to play week one. So setbacks can happen, but right now everything looks pretty good. Yeah, just like, yeah, you know, no, knee injuries early in the season. I was just saying Green was hurt early in the season, so he's probably going to be back, but but we'll have to see for sure. Yeah, to, to your point, Mike, on Henderson, his was a little bit later in the year, and um, I just did an interview with Devin Vosen, a uh, wide receiver from South Alabama, had a knee injury, I think, in week two, and he was telling me he literally just got cleared for contact, like, last week. Um, so, yeah, I, I can see where maybe – Henderson might be cutting it close for um, for the beginning of the year or, you know, right there at the end of fall camp. Um, let's move over to the defensive backfield. You know, you, you guys have referenced it a couple times. They've uh, they've lost a ton of, uh, of, of uh, over there, um, both to graduation and the transfer portal. I think it was seven total guys that uh, are gone. Um, and so the room, the room is, you know, relatively young. Um, they bring in a lot of guys in the portal uh, cornerback uh, who uh, David mentioned um, in this earlier about the spring game, Rashid reason uh, really being the only returner from last year that logged over 200 snaps for that defensive backfield. Um, can you tell us what we should expect from them in 2024 and who, who do you think uh, needs to, will need to step up for them? You can go first, David. All right, so uh, at cornerback, you probably have Rashid Reason, who has been at ODU for a while, and Angelo Rankin, who just transferred in from Richmond. Uh, Keandre uh, will also probably step in at cornerback as well. At uh, safety, we'll probably have Will Jones from South Florida, uh, Jaron Manning, who was a JUCO transfer. We've had a lot of turnover in the secondary room. Marion James, who was our maybe our best cornerback last year, transferred to TCU. Um, we had uh, two safeties, two safeties, Sean Asbury, no relation to me. Uh, Sean Asbury and Terry Jones transferred to Indiana. And uh, we also had uh, Taj Rael transfer to, I believe, Memphis. So we've had a yep. lot of turnover. And a lot of people are expecting the secondary to be a weakness on our team. Having said that, I like the guys that we brought in. I think we reloaded pretty well in the secondary. Um, I think Angelo Rankin from Richmond is going to be a pretty good cornerback. I think Rashid Reason has very de developed pretty nicely at corner. I think we're going to have competitions everywhere, but um, they didn't look bad in the spring game. They looked pretty good in the spring game and look up to par. Of course, fall camp, we'll have to see. Um, last year, the completion percentage was really high, actually. The quarterbacks were able to complete their passes against the secondary. But kind of like how we talked about sacks as they're a team stat, I feel like completion percentage for a defense is a team stack as well because if the pass rush can't get to the quarterback, then the quarterback has all time to complete a pass. So it's not all on the secondary for having a high completion percentage. But there's also a lot of tacklers in the secondary we got to replace. Taj Rael, Terry Jones, Sean Asbury, those safeties were very good at coming up and defending the run and making tackles. And we got to replace that. We got to make sure the new guys understand the system and can come up and make tackles when they're asked to. I'll throw in a couple more names uh, David didn't mention. Ashton Whitner, he was a Georgia Southern transfer that played here last year. He's going to play some at the safety position. Uh, they're really high on Patrick Smith-Young from North Texas. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he was a contributor in North Texas. Big pickup for us there. I expect him to contribute. Um, David did mention Jerron Manning. I think his ceiling might be the highest in our secondary. I'm interested to see and watch him uh, develop. But there's other guys that have kind of been lost in the shuffle that have transferred here as well that have either been banged up and just haven't been able to contribute yet. Uh, Jeremy Mack from Colorado is one of them. And then Langston, is it Langston Williams? Langston Williams from Colorado State. Yeah. But both of them have dealt with some injury issues that have kind of delayed their ability to make an impact last season. They can come in and help now, um, adding into those other guys like Angela Rankin and Will Jones. Uh, it's a talented group. It's just – it'll be interesting to see how it all comes together. I am worried about replacing Terry Jones because, as David mentioned, he was fantastic and as a tackler. Um, he's – a major reason we won that Georgia State game. Uh, his energy. Double safety blitz. <laughs> yeah, he missed that first half, right, because he had that uh, targeting suspension. And he comes in the second half and everything changes. Uh, he was just bringing good vibes to that defense, and I think replacing him is going to be a tough task. I think that we can do it, but that is going to decide how good this unit can be. When uh, when I watched the spring game, the safeties was on defense was probably the position I was trying to pay the most attention to because, like you said, we had so much change. And at least to me, in the spring game, there seemed like a, a lot of rotation. Um, but like, if I had to pick two guys I thought played the most in that game, and again, it's not well, not even a game; it's a showcase. It looked like it was Mario Easterly and, and Ashton Whitner. Um, but you know, you guys, like like you said, we bring in a lot of transfers as well. Um, if you guys had to pick who you think those three starting safeties are, who, who do you think they are? Well, uh, I guess I'll take this one. <laughs> uh, if I had to pick, because it is open competition, fall camp yeah. is going to happen and, you know, put these names in a bag and shuffle them. Um, it's anyone's game. I am not counting anyone out to winning it. But if I had to pick and you're making me pick, I'm going to say Ashton Whitmer. Patrick Smith Young and Will Jones. I would sub Will for Jerron Manning. Just yeah, because and, of- yeah, absolutely. Like you can't go wrong right now. We're gonna they're gonna battle it out this this summer camp, and this is probably this and the offensive line are probably the biggest position battles we're gonna see uh, this August. And it, it's a good problem to have that we don't know. Yeah. Because that means we have depth. Um, and none of these guys are bad options. So it's yeah. going to be really interesting to see who rises above the rest. But you could see a guy that doesn't start the season ends up being one of the best guys in the secondary because he came in and made a play. All right. If you had to pick a defensive player to have a breakout type season in 2024, who are you picking? I mean, I mentioned him earlier, but Chris Trinidad, I think they're they're expecting him to make a major leap this season. And uh, just talking to him about his offseason and his plans and his working out, it sounds like he's got that on his mind, and I'm expecting him to kind of break out. You know, I, I'm going to pick someone from the secondary and say uh, Will Jones, and I think Will Jones is going to do his best to replace – Terry Jones and getting just a lot of tackles and play well in the secondary. All right. Uh, now with spring practice over, which position group or groups, uh, and we're getting ahead into fall camp, you know, I guess a week and a half or so, uh, which group do you feel is the most concerning? I mean, it's the offensive line. You don't go and add all those bodies in the summer if you're confident in that group and uh, I think they did really well with what they've added, but it's still a big question mark until we play. I got to echo him, the offensive line. And, you know, we can repeat this until the cow comes home, cows come home and say, like, it is a team stat, quarterback, receivers, they all have blame. The, the offensive line can play better. We cannot allow 62 sacks in a season, 32 sacks in the Sun Belt, which was last a Sun Belt. We need to protect the quarterback better. 
and they were pretty good at the running game, and we had a lot of good running game r- running lanes, and that needs to continue too. You can't just let up on that either. But pass blocking needs to get better, and uh, I think this unit can do it, but I'm going to look forward to it. <laughs> well, it's getting pretty late, you know, in terms of, of the season and adding people, and I don't know off the top of my head the scholarship situation at Old Dominion, but do you think they're maybe looking to still add anyone to this team, or do you think they're pretty much set? I think they're pretty much set. Um Last time I was told, I may, maybe they have one more spot, but maybe you save that for someone who excels in the summer camp and you, you boost them from a walk-on to a scholarship guy. Um, yeah, I don't expect any more pieces to be added at this point. Right. Uh, Ronnie spoke with Mike on the pod and said he was expecting to add a wide receiver, an offensive lineman, and a defensive lineman. And since I heard that from Ronnie's lips, we've added – all those positions. So I don't see us picking up anyone else. When it comes to recruitment of new players and retention of existing players, how have you guys seen NIL and the transfer portal impact ODU? I know you guys, you know, are very involved with the the NIL collective and that's a, that's a great thing. Um, But but what what kind of impacts have you guys seen? Well, uh, it's definitely having an impact with retaining players but there's obviously a limit to that. If a P4 school calls, there's not much we can do to match those uh, dollar amounts. Um, what we need to see is right now, just like ODAF, and the collective is hung up or put together by a handful of major donors. To make us grow and become the next level where we can maybe compete and keep guys that are getting P5 offers, we need the regular fans to step up and join uh, and that just hasn't happened yet. We need more regular folks to just join the 757 Club. It's $7.57 a month. That's it. And you can have an impact on, on the collective. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely having an impact. I can, If I could say it, we're not allowed to. I could tell you all the guys we signed this season because of NIL. I don't know if it was the main driver, but they're getting paid, and – we're able to do that now. Uh, it's only year two of this, and we're, I don't know, we're, we're in a very good position in IL-wise, but we can be in an amazing position if we can get more regular fans to join up. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with Mike on that. We need to get more regular fans. Uh, $7.57, that's a cup of coffee at Starbucks once a month. We, we can do better, and we can get more fans, and we can keep more talent here in the 757. Um, I'm actually friends with one of the major NIL contributors to a rival Sunbelt team, and he tells me a lot about how NIL has really changed uh, our conference and his team. Uh, And uh, last season, we had a lot of turnover because a lot of our players were poached by other, uh, other teams with deeper pockets. And I do think this season was the first time that other teams in the Sun Belt really saw the same thing happen to them. And it happened to us, and and it's going to be a problem in the G5. But at the same time, what comes around goes around. A lot of uh, backups in the Power 4 are going to want more playing time. And Ricky Ronnie has spoken about how we need to get those guys who initially – uh, committed to those power four teams, those big schools that want to come home to Hampton Roads, want to come home to Norfolk and Virginia Beach and get more playing time. And I do think Ricky Ronnie and his staff has made the most of NIL and made the most of Transfer Portal because a lot has changed since since he was hired back in 2020. There was not this much movement. There's a lot more movement now, and he's doing really well. What do you guys think has to happen here in 2024 for you to define the season as a success? So, I mean, there's a lot of caveats with that answer. Um, We play a very difficult schedule. Um, I'm not sure anyone else in the Sun Belt really plays as difficult a schedule as we do. We don't have an FCS game. We rarely do. Um, We have two Power 4 schools we're playing. We're going on the road to an SEC school. They might not be the best program, but that's still a tough environment to go and play in in week one. Uh, ECU has reloaded. 
uh, in the portal. They are putting all their chips in for this one season. It could go great. It could go bad for them, but they're going to be a talented team when they come into Ballard this year. And then Virginia Tech has drones who uh, might push himself into the Heisman race. Uh, he's that good. I don't know how good the rest of their team really is without him, but he makes them different. And how that this team responds if they start out 0-3 is going to really decide how this, this season can go. I think we'll have an opportunity to win a couple of those games, but expecting them to go – 0-3 is pretty reasonable, I think. And it's going to be depend on how they react if they are 0-3. Uh, we saw it a few years ago. They reacted really well, and they ended up going to a bowl game. The year after, they start out slow, and things kind of unraveled and just got worse from there. They, go, they win three games. Last year, they reacted well and played extremely well in the Sun Belt, where they were – couple drives away from playing in the Sun Belt championship game. Uh, it's all about how they react to when things go bad, and that will decide this season. But for me to be a success, success we need to win more than six games. I we haven't, Mike. We haven't done it a single time under Ricky. He's obviously changed the the bar. I mean, we've made two bowl games when we've only had one in, like, what, the five years before that? Um. But making a bowl isn't enough now. Now we need to make that next step forward and win seven-plus games, in my opinion. I agree. We need a winning season. We haven't had a winning season since 2016. 2016, uh, Bobby Wilder took David Washington and Zach Pascal to the Bahamas Bowl, and Ray Lowry at running back ran very well. And that was our last winning season, was 2016. And I think the world of Ricky Ronnie and his staff and I, he, in his three seasons, we got bowl eligibility twice. That's awesome. But we need to have a winning season. And I do think this roster is very capable of not only having a winning season, but maybe even competing for the conference itself. But the schedule is really hard. As Mike alluded to, we got to play it. We got to open up against an SEC team, South Carolina. Yeah, they haven't been to a bowl game, but they're still an SEC team that recruits like an SEC team. And then we have to play East Carolina at home. East Carolina was bad last year, but they have reloaded. They Their NIL pockets, they went deep in them, and they got a lot of talent. And then we have to play Virginia Tech, which is probably the best Virginia Tech team that we've seen since 2018. We all know what happened in 2018 with our big upset against them. But preseason, this this Virginia Tech team is very talented. We have to play a Mac school, Bowling Green State University. Uh, Bowling Green is actually a better Mac school, and they're a sleeper to win the Mac. Um, and then we have to play – then we draw two of the uh, best Sunbelt West teams with Arkansas State and Texas State. They might be one and two in the West. And then we have to play the rest – of the very rugged Sun Belt East. We have a really hard schedule. I think we can, and I think we will, go at least six and six or better against the schedule. But even if we don't, that may not say we were a bad team. It was just a very rough schedule. All right, guys, we, we've kind of covered a lot of ground today, but is there anything you want to share or think that we should know about this 2024 Old Dominion Monarchs football team that we haven't already talked about? We didn't talk about the kicking game or special teams at all, which is kind of surprising because yeah, at some we, point in our in our timeline, our best players were special teamers. Yes, yeah. I mean, so <laughs> we got replaced. We were replacing our punter. The kicker returned, right? But but the punter, we have to replace the punter. Yeah, and we obviously had an issue with the kicking game late in the season with not getting kicks off on uh, fast enough in the bowl game. Yeah, major reason why that bowl game went sideways. Yeah, so I'm really interested to see the changes at special teams to see if we've learned from the mistakes of last season to uh, better ice games away because you just make one of those three field goals we missed and it's a different game. 
I think my final thoughts are just that I've seen some predictors try to put ODU at the bottom of the Sun Belt East, and I, I don't think we're there. I think we're we're much better than the bottom of the Sun Belt East. I think ODU is going to turn some heads and make some upsets and get six and six or better. And I think that's my final prediction. All right, uh, Mike and David, thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with us and share your knowledge about Old Dominion football. We greatly appreciate it. All right, thanks, Justice. Thanks, Justice. If you are watching on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're listening in podcast form, please rate and review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Thank you all for your support. And until the next time, we are the G5 Hive. Oh, my God.